Welcome to hour number two on a Monday with Hashtag Daily K's host, Peter B. Tired of just scratching the surface of Korea? Want to get deep in the weeds? We unpack everything about Korea through its history on... Now and Then with David. It is a Monday. That means it's time to let go of any preconceived ideas that history is difficult and boring. And we look at usually a current topic, something that's hot off the press in Korea, and do a deep dive with Dr. Professor David Tizard in the studio. How are we doing today? I am excellent. And although we don't have any video feed today, I, mm. I feel like I'm looking really good today, <laughs> just because the listeners can't say I thought I'd start with that. <laughs> the voice is sounding super sexy, I must say. Yeah. Are you a summer man, David? Is that your season for you do you have a favorite season i always like autumn i'm not sure why perhaps because i was born oh. in autumn i'm a september child oh. and so autumn always struck me as the one but summers are different anywhere the british summer is very different from the korean summer yes we have listeners from all over the world and <laughs> actually growing up in australia it mm. was interesting because summer there was christmas oh yes was uh, it cold though like properly cold would you, i i mean like you We associate oh, yes, Christmas sorry. with snow and, yes. and all of these types of mm-hmm. things. In Australia, you have summer on the beach. Yes. You know, it's baking hot. That would be the hottest time of the year in yeah, December. In December. January. Yeah. Oh, and wow. so summer is, is really different all over. But I, I've often been this kind of autumn child, I think. That resonates That's with me. That's interesting in Korea. You must have heard, you know, Kaul t a n a n a m j a The guy is getting a bit sentimental in yeah. the autumn, whereas girls, it's p o m t a n a n y o j a So they get more affected by the spring. You. completely fit the stereotype i i I try to be a free will unique (laughs) snowflake but one of my favorite emoticons on uh the the yellow cow thing (laughs) was this was this guy with his collar up as the autumn leaves blew out oh wow i always used to use that because i thought it looked pretty cool Mm -hmm. and then people said david do you know what this means (laughs) and it was apparently the complete opposite meaning as i'd been using it so i I just been confusing people yeah Um, autumn guy there there is that kind of sentimentality that kicks in in autumn for many males apparently in Korea and when I first found out about that and tried to explain to our listeners a lot of them were left just scratching their heads and uh, I still don't think I fully understand the I'm concept. I'm nodding my head in complete agreement. <laughs> It resonates with me Mr. Bin. Today's topic, we're talking about the weather. We are talking about the weather because in South Korea something that South Korea has long championed, mm. it's distinct for Four seasons. <laughs> uh, and this you'll find in lots of Korean literature, mm. in lots of Korean promotion, tourism agencies. There is a danger that Korea's four seasons mm. may no longer be with us. Oh. This is part of a global change. I'm mm-hmm. sure many of our listeners will be aware, as you are, Pete. Yeah. But the new UN report on climate crisis is truly f o r frightening. Mm. We already know about the reasons for the current heat waves, the flooding, the forest fires, the ice melting, the extreme weather events sweeping the planet. And depending where we live, Mm. we'll be experiencing different extreme weather conditions. It's not all the same. But it seems that the data shows us that burning fossil fuels in our cars, the planes, the factories, They're driving a lot of that climate change. And Mm. it's, you know, it's our responsibility to try to do something about it because we keep getting these statistics (laughs) and... Nothing really much seems to change. Yeah, and and this, like, putting aside climate change deniers for one second, I think, you know, even if we're all on board with this idea that the climate is changing, it's just seemingly too slow of a change, Mm -hmm. a gradual change, where we all know, all right, we shouldn't be doing this, we shouldn't be doing this, we should be cutting back on admissions and tackling this problem. But because it's so slow moving, it's not like a nuclear bomb or an earthquake, Mm. I feel like humans in general, we're not going to change quick enough to tackle this. 
There's one thing that you will have noticed is changing rather quickly. Mm-hmm. We've spoken about it on this show before, which has been the real big increase, the focus on identity, the mm. focus on individual rights, mm. the focus on, you know, these social cultural changes in terms of gay marriage and civil yes. rights. They're, they're going at breakneck speed mm-hmm. in many different countries. Yeah. That's a good thing. Mm-hmm. However, I would suggest that that focus on the individual, that focus on our self as a brand, removes us further and further from the natural world we inhabit. Mm. There's a Korean-born German philosopher called Han Byung-chol. Uh-huh. I'm not sure if you've read any of his work. No. Really interesting, Han Byung-chol. And he talks about, as we become so enamored with ourselves in society, mm. we lose touch with the natural world. Mm. And this just might be the problem. It, mm. it, it's we're so focused on ourselves that we forget the, the environment in which we live. Oh, wow. That is really an interesting link between individuality and potentially climate change. Or why we're not doing as much about it because mm. we don't think it affects us as much. We're more engaged with ourselves. But you mentioned a nuclear bomb. The UN chief, Antonio Guterres, said in this report that it is a code red For humanity. So he's using uh, no uncertain terms, although whether it will make a difference it remains to be seen. Yeah, I, I don't know about Korean media in too much detail, but following Western media, in particular the UK, it does seem like the language is getting more and more severe each year, right, with yep. climate change, yep. saying, you know, we've reached breaking point, we're past breaking point, and things like this. So I can feel the pressure is being dialed up, but I don't see that t r a n s l a t i n g into action, both on the national level and individually speaking. But I think I'm right in saying, compared to certain other countries, especially places like maybe the US of A, Korea is more on board with the fact that climate change is happening and, and we can do something about it. I don't think there are too many vociferous naysayers on that front. It- Um, perhaps, or maybe they don't get the bandwidth that they're afforded to <laughs> uh-huh. in other places. They can, okay. Because I, 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 I think there are, of course, climate change mm, deniers. And course. there are flat earthers in South Korea as yes. well. We're only human here. Um, what I will say is that in Asia, where we're based, and hopefully our, our little program that we do today mm-hmm. makes one, <laughs> 0.1% of difference. In Asia, the primary impact of climate change is going to be on the monsoon cycle. Mm. So Pete, you will have noticed over the last week or so here in Seoul, South Korea, yeah. it's been unbearably hot, mm-hmm. and then it's been unbearably wet. Yes, it's Not always at the same time, but you know, real heat, and then just torrential rain. Yeah, it's hard to distinguish now, like the monsoon season, Mm -hmm. when does that start and finish? And then when is it just a summer shower like we have in Korean as Honagi? But it's hard to say, is this still the monsoon season or not? Because traditionally it would be in a certain period usually done and dusted in July. But it seems to be creeping this way and that way. Those are changing and this will be a a regional thing, not Mm. just affecting South Korea. But on that monsoon cycle, the scientists say, that areas that traditionally get a lot of rain, they're going to get even more rain Uh concentrated in a shorter period Uh and the dry regions are going to become even drier. So it's really going to exacerbate Mm. and exaggerate those monsoon effects in this part of the world. Yeah, I think that's what makes this climate change much more difficult. And we changed that terminology, you know, a good couple of decades back, I feel, from global warming to climate change because some places are not necessarily getting just hotter, right? They might be getting wetter. Some places might even be getting cooler so is this changing climate but that i think makes it harder for people to unite behind and say look this is happening everywhere but it's not this might be happening in korea the monsoons in another part it might be just more extreme temperatures and kind of knitting that all together to show people proof evidence I think that's part of the problem here of getting people behind it. I I completely agree with you, Pete. And and reminding people that the forest fires in Siberia, Greece and California are connected to the ice loss in Greenland and Antarctica. (laughs) And the... The the rainfall in Germany and the the rainfall in central China that killed more than 300 last year, these are all connected. It might Mm. not seem like it. We might just be thinking of fires and floods and landslides as separate. But a lot of the scientists would say uh, they are causally connected and we should understand them in that way. even though it might be cognitively quite challenging. Yeah, we do need to get our heads around this, people. Let's try our best to see this as maybe the biggest danger to humanity, right? I think if we could, like, 
clearly have a rankings table <laughs> and, you know, see this as top of the list, we might be able to focus on the issue a little bit more. There's too much to worry about in our daily lives, I feel, though. Welcome to Arirang Radio. If you are in Jeju, 88.7 in Jeju City, 88.1 in Seogipu City, 101.9 in the Daejeong area. We're back for part two now and then with David Tizard in the studio talking about the weather and climate change here in Korea, but it's not just localized, obviously. And you mentioned this uh, early on that the big issue and maybe what can capture Koreans' imagination is the threat of no more four seasons. Mm. The amount I've heard this in Korea, you know, we've got our distinct four seasons. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting because, you know, we just took it for granted in the UK, yeah? We've got spring, we've got summer, autumn and winter. Yeah. But it wouldn't be, like, e m p h a s i z e d to people as an attractive part of Britain, right? That's just... When I was growing up, actually, I just thought that was the, the, the deal everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere had four right, seasons, absolutely. right? Yeah, I know that's not true in, like, tropical areas, but still... The, the closer to the equator you are or, or the further from the equator, that will change. And I think because South Korea, it, you know, down, it's much further down, mm-hmm. closer towards the equator. And then when you go down that way, when you get Singapore, lots of people from Singapore will be visiting Korea and vice mm. versa, more so than perhaps the UK. Okay. And so when people come from Singapore, for them, it's just summer all the time yes. in Singapore. <laughs> They don't have that. And so regionally, I think the four seasons here are... Awesome, because Korea gets snow, Mm. and not many places on this kind of 38th line would get snow to the level that South Korea has. So if you you spend any time here or look at any promotional materials, you will hear this, (laughs) four seasons. And you're right, it feels a bit... But I thought all countries had four yeah. seasons. <laughs> When I first came, that's what I wanted to say, but I'd feel rude. I'd be like, yeah. oh, yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. We have spring and, and autumn. But since I've lived here in 2008, I think even back then, people were kind of starting to worry and say, mm. yep. oh, but our springs and autumns are getting very short. Absolutely. So in the first part, we talked about the southern hemisphere, Australia, where mm. it's flipped. South Korea, obviously in the northern hemisphere. So spring... you know, is often associated with being a delightful time of year. Mm. That runs from roughly April to June, traditionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The summer, muggy and wet. So this is not a dry summer like we're used to in the UK. In South Korea, if you're going to have an umbrella, Mm. you're going to have an umbrella not in the winter. You're going to have it in the summer. (laughs) Yes. Because that's when the water comes. That's when the heat comes. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, July to August. The the, the autumn, sorry, the fall, (laughs) the autumn, my my favorite time of year is September to November. Mm -hmm. That's very refreshing. You get the, you know, just a nice bit of warmth, but a bit of crispness. Beautiful skies as well. Beautiful skies. And also the winter, beautiful skies in South Korea, the winter, you get bright blue skies. Mm, Yes. Freezing cold, but blue (laughs) and The UK, we associate winter with being dark and cloudy and rainy. Here, you get these bright blue skies, not a cloud in the sky, Mm. and roads filled with snow, freezing cold snow, very dry, (laughs) and that will be December to March. So there are four very actually distinct seasons, Mm. but will they last is the next question. Yeah, and and how the time frames are very fluid these days, right? And it seems to me another problem with climate change is it's not consistent, right? Every (laughs) year is so different here in Korea. I think it was last year where we had a lot of heat in the summertime and it was just proper hot and not too much rain after Mm. the monsoon season. The year before, I think it was, when we had like rain every day for weeks on end. I think it was something like six weeks. And, And comparing those two alone was so difficult to see any kind of trend. And I think that's why here in Korea, no one's like given it the death sentence that the seasons are gone. But it's mm. like they're, they're just so inconsistent. They're so hard to tell because we talk about it on the show a lot, actually, on Daily K. We have the 24 seasonal divisions traditionally in Korea. That's right. yeah. And that's because it used to almost run like clockwork. You know, mm-hmm. today is going to be the first snow. It wouldn't or, be 100% accurate. Or it was accurate. the clock. Yes. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. It was the clock. But nowadays, those seasonal divisions, when we talk about it, it's often me saying... Well, it's nothing like that right now, what it's supposed mm. to be in the past. Uh, and I think Koreans 
maybe more so than in other places, maybe because of those traditional divisions and the Four Seasons were being very proud of them. We're kind of even more hurt by the fact that this might be changing. You know, listening to you, Pete, I can see your your desire or your keenness <laughs> for systematic and logical thought. You I like want it. climate change yes. is the number one enemy. So you want <laughs> yes. them ranked and you want that there. And then you want the climate divided systematically across the things. So I love it. it. It's, it's a good way to approach it. But <laughs> you're, you're absolutely correct. The, the big worry here seems to be that spring and autumn are kind of disappearing. Mm. Uh, They're merging into it. And it is where, let's just make this point as well, that for South Korea, for the most part, Japan and China protect South Korea geographically Mm. from things such as typhoons, Ah. which affect a a lot of the other parts of this Asian region. Mm. So um, a week or so ago in the Philippines, you have earthquakes there, Uh you have in that kind of Pacific ring of fire, There's lots of extreme weather conditions. Mm. Here in South Korea, it's relatively safe from uh, typhoons, earthquakes, and these kind of things. They will occasionally get through, Mm -hmm. um, but only sporadically. And so what we're dealing with here in Korea is just those initial four seasons becoming really exaggerated in certain ways. Mm. And and the typhoon season. I mean, I I was... I guess we're kind of lucky in the UK, especially if you live in the south of the UK. I'd say... we have even less extremes of, of weather and things like that. In the like UK, that. we say, oh, do you remember that strong wind? <laughs> yeah, when, exactly. the, when, the, when the barbecue blew over or something <laughs> like that. And that would be extreme weather for British people, the yeah, strong wind. Right, or, or a storm, right, which caused a tree to fall down or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that would be it. So when I came to Korea, I was actually, maybe because I didn't realise the, the situation in Japan or China or Southeast Asia, I was thinking about how extreme it is, like the extreme cold, you know, yeah. that in the winter... It'll be minus something degrees, whereas in London, it rarely go down to minus something in the daytime. Right. And then in the summer, you're getting to well over 30 degrees. I remember my first summer, 2008, I think it was 30 plus every day for a whole month. And I was just like, oh, my goodness. But but it's a different type of heat. It's a sticky heat. Mm. It's a wet heat. And so it it feels even hotter than 30 plus, I would say, because of the humidity that you get here. Summers here are wet. Yeah. And and so I was like, oh, my goodness, I can't deal with this. I I like the UK's less extreme, maybe more frequently rainy and miserable and gloomy weather Mm. and the fog. But I really miss that. And now here in Korea, if you compare us to our neighbours, though, it's interesting to see that we're less extreme, but perhaps... going to be more similar to the Mm -hmm. neighbours in terms of typhoons? Because in Korea, during the summer typhoon season, you get those news alerts, right? Where it's like, make sure your windows are secure. Maybe even stick up newspaper on your windows just in case they're (laughs) going to crack through. I mean, luckily enough, I've never had any... adverse effects from the weather mm. at my properties or cars or anything like that. At your properties, yeah. sir. <laughs> <laughs> my wealth of properties around the country. No, where I live. And so uh, I, I've, I've thought, okay, I, I'm lucky here, but who knows what's going to happen in the next few years if that increases, like the damage from, from the weather. It's going to be a more inconvenient, uncomfortable place to live, I suppose. And and just for the international listeners, when you watch Korean dramas or you see these idols, these celebrities, Mm. and they're looking amazing (laughs) and they're dressed fantastically and their skin is beautiful, now just imagine the conditions that they're doing that in, (laughs) in these monsoons, because Mm. I sometimes look at these people and go, How do you look so good? How are you doing that? Well, the weather is the way it is. But yeah. that's the reality and that's it. Um, you're absolutely right. So a lot of these changes, you're going to find that flooding is going to become an issue. So mm. it's not these dramatic earthquake typhoons yeah. things. But in South Korea, we're going to find flooding is going to affect certain areas. And then at the same time, and this is where it becomes a little bit paradoxical, drought is going to be the big thing. Mm. So you're going to suffer here in South Korea from flooding and drought. One of the things that will help South Korea survive is it's less and less reliant on its own agriculture and its agricultural produce. So this is going to affect the farmers. Mm. But domestically, South Korea doesn't really rely on its own agricultural Mm. produce. It's it's developed beyond that now. Okay, yeah, because we do import a lot of food here in Korea. 
But I'm supposing, because this is a global issue, if we're not keeping an eye on how this is going to affect global productivity of agriculture, we could still be in a very testing situation if other places are affected where we import our food from. Yeah. Maybe it's okay that we get such a small amount domestically, but if we're relying on overseas places where climate change is also extreme, who knows, right, what the future holds there? Who knows? I'm not sure how much time we've got in this part. Mm. Let me just try to get this stat. We yes. talked about the four seasons, so let's just finish that. Um, between 1912 t- until 2020, mm. they've been recording this. So nearly 100 years of data. Yeah. From 1912 to 2020, summer has become 20 days longer oh, wow. than what it used to be 100 years ago. Nearly a the month. S- yeah, the start dates of spring and summer, the start date of spring has become 17 days earlier. The start day of summer has become 11 days earlier. Wow. Now the longest season in Korea is, is summer again with 118 days. <gasps> the shortest one, which makes me very sad, is <gasps> autumn. It's down to 69. Wow. So looking, it's not just our perceptions and our mm. feelings, but looking at this 100-year study... Mm. They're not only changing when they occur, but also how long they occur for. Yeah. And to be honest, that 69 days, it sounds longer than I feel. Like, I (laughs) feel that summer continues way past September 1st, right? It gets way in there. Yep. And then winter starts, I don't know, maybe end of November. So I'm thinking like (laughs) mid-October to like November, maybe six weeks. And the autumn here as well, it's not like you'll get gradual temperature changes. Some days might be hot and some Mm. days might be relatively cold. I like hoodie weather and I can't consistently wear my hoodie as my only outerwear every day. That's what I measure things by. And so I'm very disappointed. For me, it's what I wear into the lecture halls. Am I wearing a <laughs> jumper and a jacket and a tie? Or <laughs> oh, for the hoodie days, Pete, for the hoodie days. <laughs> you should try it, Udo, you know, with all these changing boundaries of what professors could be as well. Mm-hmm. Put your hood up as well. And, and in terms of the temperature in general, it is on a rising trend here in Korea as well. Like, Yeah, it is. And temperature rises are going to be bigger in cities and inland areas than the coastal regions. Mm-hmm. So around the coast, you're not going to see as much change. But okay. in, in, in Seoul, I spend a lot of time in the countryside yeah. and I notice temperature differences. Oh, Seoul wow. is much, much hotter. Uh-huh. And that's, it's much, much hotter because of the concrete, because of the cars, because mm. of that concentration of energy yeah. and the heat can't escape. Yeah. Whereas in the countryside, it, it, it's much better. So over the past 10 years, again, temperature increases in Seoul has gone up by like 0.24. Mm. You also find the same in, in, in Daegu, in Incheon. So this might mean more and more people leave the cities. They 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 go with this tal soul, leaving mm-hmm. soul phenomenon. We might see more of that. Yeah, we did mention that on the show before. This might accelerate it. And who knows, maybe it will have some benefits as well. We can't just say, and I have heard this, not from climate change deniers, but from people who have a more nuanced view, mm. there will be some places that will benefit from climate change. Absolutely. Right? In terms of what they can grow and how comfortable it is to live. But other places will definitely see uh, some, some disadvantages. Every day's K-pop. Anytime and everywhere. Arirang, Arirang. Arirang Radio. Hot, hot summer indeed. Uh, Something that I've gotten used to living here in Korea, having the air conditioning on a lot of the time. I really do feel how hot the cities are. When you walk past a car on a hot summer's day that's on, you know, you feel there's a little zone around it, which is even hotter, even more unbearable. Inside, obviously, it's air conditioned and lovely. Lovely. And then you walk past a building and you've got the shilwegis, the outer component of the air conditioning, blasting out hot air. Mm. You're like, what are we doing here? Like, we're making it worse, it seems, by trying to make it better indoors. And... For some people, there might be different experiences Mm. per country, but air conditioning is blasting all the time in South Korea. (laughs) It's not so much let's open some windows and get some fans going anymore. But in South Korea, if you walk into a department, (laughs) they even have words for it, which is like air conditioning illness. Yes. (laughs) Right. And so I've been to the doctor and he'll, he'll say to me, 
have you been next to an air conditioner a lot? And yeah. if I'm in the lecture hall or something like that, he'll say, Nenjang <laughs> Byung uh-huh. or something like that? Nenbang Byung, I think. So, thank like you. A cold yeah. room disease. A cold, they even have a name for it in South Korea, yeah. a cold room disease, because here the air cons are always blasting. Mm. It makes us comfortable. Yeah. Again, but at what cost that we need to consider? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing to look at as well. Our neighbors to the north, right? Yeah. North Korea is a very different society, despite being so close. And I guess geographically, because it's in the north, maybe you might think it will not be as badly affected because it's cooler. But I'm sure they're going to struggle with their perhaps lack of infrastructure with any changes. Yeah, I'm very happy that we're able to talk about this little part of the topic. Mm -hmm. So in the previous part, I said that South Korea is no longer really an agricultural society. That's with no disrespect to the farmers and the workers Mm -hmm. here who, who do great jobs. North Korea is an agricultural society. Mm. It relies on its own produce and product Mm -hmm. to feed its citizens. It's so dependent on it. In 1994, with extreme uh, weather conditions, the drought and flooding in the mid to early 90s, that resulted in this famine in North Korea Mm. that's on record as as causing absolute devastation, the loss of millions of lives, actually. Mm. And if we get these continued extreme temperatures changes with droughts and flooding, this could be a real existential threat for the North Korean regime because quite simply, whatever else happens with Chairman Kim Mm Jong-un, nuclear weapons (laughs) or, or the United States or anything else... If there's no food to feed the people because they're reliant on these, then, you know, that's a humanitarian disaster. That's Mm. something really tragic because they simply don't have the ability, the finances to to import all their food from overseas or just have convenience stores on every corner with air conditioning and triangle (laughs) gimbaps. It's not like that. And so for North Korea, this is a real existential threat, I believe. Yeah, coming far too soon for what they can handle, it seems. And yeah, I wonder how the society is going to react, how they can react as well, how they will rise up, perhaps. In, In terms of South Korea... And and climate change, I said that, in my opinion, it seems like there's not too much of naysaying about this going on. Yeah. The Mm -hmm. other thing that I notice is it's kind of, I don't know, paradoxical in that South Korea seems to be really good at trying to roll out new technologies like electronic vehicles, electric buses I've seen now more and more. Hydrogen as well is being pushed. And I was speaking to one of my friends who works in that industry saying Korea is really at the forefront for hydrogen manufacturing plants and things like this. Mm. But at the same time, we talk about statistics on the show that we create the most plastic waste per person in the world Mm -hmm. and things like this. So I feel like... Does that just make us the same as everyone else? As we've got a big, like, environmentally friendly push, but we're also creating way too much waste and with the air conditioning and stuff put on? It's important to look at the data, and I'm really happy that your show does do this and allow us the opportunity to look at what's going on. Now, for all of South Korea's amazing strengths and all of the things that it does, at the same time, it's also one of the world's top producers of CO2 emissions per capita. Wow. It's more than double the global average and emissions have been increasing year after year. So the government has got these stated goals Mm -hmm. of going carbon neutral by 2050 if possible. We have got these amazing companies that Mm -hmm. are producing, you know, if you think about technological or car semiconductor production, Mm. South Korean companies are at the forefront of this technology. But I think it's about, you know, putting it through society and and making all people use that. Mm. Um, Only 2%, according to the OEC data, only 2% of South Korea's total primary energy supply comes from renewals. (gasps) To put that into perspective, in America, it's 8%, China, 10%. OECD average is 11. What? For South Korea, it's only 2%. So it it seems to need to be able to address that in Mm. ways. I believe it will, uh, and more attention being drawn to it. But in terms of using renewable energy and CO2 emissions, South Korea is falling behind at the moment. Wow, that is quite stark and also quite shocking, I'm sure, to many of our listeners, to me as well, because 
Korea has some of the most amazing solar panel producers in the world. I, I looked into one company before, and they're exporting a lot to Europe and places like that. Yeah, yeah. Why do we not have more? Maybe like our topography and our land mass being so small has some part to play in it. Because I know renewables take a lot of like a number of solar panels to create the same amount of energy. You need to cover a wide area. Maybe we just don't have that. It's also difficult, I think, politically Mm. for a government these days to ask its citizens Mm. to make sacrifices. Mm. So imagine you're the South Korean government and you tell people, (laughs) right, there's a hose water ban, there's a water hose ban (laughs) or something like that. We experience those in other countries. In South Korea, I don't think people are really ever told... Mm. Don't use water, don't use air conditioning. It's just like, Mm. go at it. It's free. And that's part of South Korea's own democratization. Sure. And escaping from military rule. Mm. uh, That's part of it. But maybe that might come. You don't don't want to be told what to do having that background of dictatorship and whatnot. Uh, And I don't know. I feel like in all countries now with the polarized political systems in many places, it's very difficult to say that with the next election just a couple of years away, right? So short-termism is going to win every time. And and the opposition (laughs) bashing you for everything that you do. Here's one thing that Korea does do, and and Mm -hmm. you will have noticed this, Pete, is that we get messages about the weather a lot. Oh, yes. And so on your phone, and you'll get these emergency alerts coming Mm -hmm. if there's heavy rain, if there's heat waves, Mm. if there are extreme... weather conditions all citizens will be alerted yeah whether they want to be alerted or not <laughs> your phone will ring and in terms of heat if the daily temperature is 33 degrees or higher for more than two days mm. we get these kind of heat warnings yeah. and, and they will come through on the phone and tell people you know be be vigilant Mm. and protect yourself yeah um what we're noticing is that these heat wave warnings are coming this year they're coming three weeks earlier than last year oh wow three weeks so from mid-may and on june 19th these first heat wave warnings that are based on 33 degrees or higher for Mm -hmm. more than two days they came in in the southern parts in daegu In Gwangju, uh, Cholanamdo, wow. they were getting them up to three weeks earlier this year. Yeah, I heard the tropical nights where it's over 25 degrees. They were f- in June for the first time ever on record or something in parts of Korea. Yeah. So I think that the climate is changing. That is undeniable. How we're going to tackle it, we'll have to wait and see, David. Fingers we'll tackle crossed. tackle it together, everybody. Let's How do about it that, that way, yes. Yeah. Let's all make some sacrifices. Uh, Have a wonderful, hopefully not too hot, but also not too cold, because then you'll get nembang byung as well. I'm waiting for the autumn, mate. Here we go. Yeah, it's coming in your trench coat. Let's uh, (laughs) see you again next Monday, David. You can listen to Monday's segment, Now and Then, with David Tizard, every Monday from 10am KST on Hashtag Daily Cake.